good to be together, isn't it? I, I love meeting together with Jesus' people, God's people, his, his community, the church. Um, if you're visiting with us the, for the first time, uh, maybe you're thinking, wow, Christians are funny people. Why do they sing together and why do they spend time praying and what's the point of it? And it's not just sort of a, a willy-nilly sort of, ah, we do it because it's nice and that's tradition and that's what we're supposed to do. We, we sing together because actually we believe that everybody worships something. Yeah? Everybody worships something. If, if you're a, if you, whether you call yourself a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or an atheist or a materialist or anything, everybody worships, trusts, lives their life for something or someone. So you, you, you might go, I don't worship a spiritual God like a, a, a Buddha or, or Jesus. But actually, what gives you safety and comfort and purpose in life is your career or your family or something else. So everybody worships something. And so on Sundays, as Jesus followers, we come together and singing is part of us saying, we worship Jesus. The danger, of course, is that we sing nice things about Jesus on Sunday and then we go out and live like terrible people Monday to Saturday. And we're going to actually talk about that this morning. But the point of us singing is, hey, we want to, we, we want to declare together, I want to live my whole life for Jesus. He's the one who gives me purpose. He's the one who gives me hope, not other stuff. And we, we talk to God. We pray. That's all praying is. It's talking to Jesus. Because actually we believe that we have a Heavenly Father in Heaven who hears us. We're not just talking at the wall. We're not just, actually, we believe that we have a Heavenly Father who hears us and He loves to answer our prayers. Sometimes not always like we'd like Him to answer them. Anybody had Him answer a prayer in a way that, actually, I would have preferred Him to answer it differently. Yeah? Best? Yeah? A little honesty there? Renske and I were just talking about this yesterday. But we believe that He hears and that He loves us and that He walks with us through those things and He always answers one way or the other. He's a good father. And so that's why we sing. That's why we pray. And then right now we're going we're gonna to hear from the Bible. And the reason we do that is because we believe that the words in this book tell us about Jesus. And Jesus is the point of everything we do. If you could discredit Jesus, if you could prove he wasn't God, that he didn't actually rise from the dead, then I'm a fool for giving my life to this. And you all are fools for sitting here <laughs> and listening to me. Yeah, but we believe that this has the truth about Jesus. We don't worship the Bible because it's it's a whole. It, it's okay. We're not we're not like Muslims in the sense that the Bible is it itself is we worship it. No, we love the Bible because it tells us the truth about Jesus, and we love Jesus. He's the one who sets us free, and so that's why we're just going to take a little bit of time and look in the book of James. If you have your Bibles, you can open to James chapter two. If you don't, it's going to appear on the screen behind me. I think David, right? Um, and we're just going to read through. Does anyone want to read for us out loud James chapter 2 and verses 1 through 13? Anyone want to read, read that? Nathan's smiling at me cheekily from the back, so if no one else volunteers, I'm going to volunteer Nathan. <laughs> Nathan! <laughs> no, does anyone else want to read? I won't pick on Nathan this morning. Thanks, Joe. Go for it. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. A poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, and say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, was not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law of law breaking. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking the law. But he who says, 
do not commit adultery also said, do not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law, but give freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mm. You might have noticed that what Joe read was slightly different was up on the screen. That's okay. We have different translations of the original Greek in this case. Uh, and it actually helps us to know more sp exactly what the original author wrote. It's a, it's a good thing. Uh, this was a hard passage for me this week. I wrestled with this one as I was thinking about it. But what, what I hope we can do together is just to look through it and, and go, what does it mean? And, and how do we, what, is, what does Jesus have for each one of us to take away and go, ah, oh, that was for me. And, and that's in a sense, if this is your first time with us, and you're going, what am I, how do I listen? What, what my hope is, my prayer is that you would come away with one thing, maybe more, but one thing, that you go, oh, this was for me in this passage, this verse, this thought, this idea, that was for me today. Because we believe that Jesus speaks now as well. He's alive and he speaks now. And so, uh, James, he's the guy who wrote this letter. James, he's the brother of Jesus. Uh, he wrote this letter to Jewish Christians, people who are Jews, who said, actually, Jesus is the Messiah. And he wrote this letter to them in their various places where they lived. And he's dealing with, what does it mean to have a mature faith in Jesus? To have a grown-up faith, not a, 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 an immature faith in Jesus. What does that look like? And so he, he, in chapter 1, he deals with this idea of actually a mature faith is one that, that, that looks with, with joy on hard circumstances because actually we know that Jesus is always working in our difficult circumstances to make us more mature, more grown up, more healthy in our faith. Does anyone have that experience? Uh, uh, right? You go through hard things and somehow actually Jesus grows you through it. He makes you into the person he wants you to be. Does anyone else have that experience here? I know some of you do. Yeah? Yeah. <coughs> the second thing he's, he talks about is, is actually, and this is we're the continuation of where we're going to be today, is this idea that actually a healthy faith is one that it doesn't have a, a, a double life. You understand what I mean? You say, oh yeah, I believe in God over here, but actually you start to live very differently over here. It's, it's not a, a, there's not a, a link, a connection between the two. Someone at my street party put it to me this way uh, yesterday. He said, we were talking, he's, a, he's, a, he's from a Hare Krishna um, background. And he said, he said, actually, I don't think it matters what you worship. As long as you worship something, everything's got, so I don't have a problem with you worshiping Jesus. I said, I, I, said, I actually kind of disagree, sir. I said, you know, some people worship things that tell them that people with dark skin are less important than people with light skin. Uh, to me, that's wrong. And he went, oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, the things that we worship as God, actually they play out in a horizontal sense about how we relate to one another. And so actually we need to worship the right person. Yeah, if I could put it that way. And so James says it this way in verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, Brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, the Lord of glory. So what he's saying is, don't show partiality, don't show favoritism to other people who also love Jesus in particular, but I don't think we should just limit it to people who are in the church. But that's what he's talking about specifically. Don't show favoritism, don't accept bribes and, and have cliques and, and, and little tribes in, in, in the midst of your church. While you're trying, while you're, at the same time you're saying, well, I, I love Jesus, I trust Jesus. That's the basic idea of, because actually the two, they, they, they're incompatible. You can't play favorites amongst humans while still saying you love Jesus. And he's going to tell us why in a second. But before we do that, I just want to focus in on that phrase, Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And we've been talking about the coronation yesterday. You, you know why 
the, all the pomp and circumstance and all the, the robes, it, it's kind of ironic now because the king doesn't have any of those powers anymore. But all of that show, all of that is to show the glory of the king. It's to show how his wisdom and his power and his might, all the jewels and the, the guards and the army and the music. And it's so like, we, we're powerful, we're strong. It's, it's, it's showing off who the king is. The irony is that he doesn't actually have very much power anymore. And so Jesus is the Lord of glory. He's the one who has all the power. He's in charge. He's in control. He made everything. Friends, that's good news. Because when you feel out of, anyone feel out of control in your life here? You ever feel out of control? We know the one who's in control. He's the Lord of glory. He's in control of your life. He's in control of my life. You can trust him. He's the Lord of glory. And just to come back to this idea of you're holding faith. Someone who holds faith in Jesus. Again, we said everybody worships something. It's a very basic definition of a Christian. A Christian is not someone who goes to church. It's not someone who keeps all the rules. A Christian, very simply, is someone who says, I love and trust Jesus. Not just God. God has a name. His name is Jesus. Yeah. I love and trust Jesus. I'm willing to commit my life to him. I'm willing to trust him for all my big decisions. I'm willing to give him everything. I love Jesus and trust Jesus. And he's worthy of that trust because he's good. He doesn't betray you. He's faithful. A Christian is someone who trusts Jesus. And so James says, and he's going to get to an illustration, he says, you can't show partiality and make distinctions amongst yourselves. Some people are better. There's two classes of Christians. No, no, no. You can't do that and say, I'm a Jesus follower. It doesn't work. And so he gives us this illustration in verses 2 and 3, he says, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing, he doesn't say rich, but he's a man of status, a man of, could be a woman as well. Someone comes in, gold ring, fine clothing, nice car parked in the parking lot, comes in, and then somebody else comes in, is clearly poor, shabby clothing. And we treat them differently. We say welcome to both of them, but James says, but one of them, you say, you say to, the, to the wealthy man, oh, come sit here in the seat of honor. We don't really do seats of honor in our culture as much. Maybe some of you have a culture where you, you have the seat of honor at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an event or, or, or a dinner. It's the, seat, the nice seat of honor. And what can we, how can we make life comfortable for you? And at this, we say welcome to the, to the poor man, but ah, go sit in the back. Coffee's over there. Have that. Yeah, we made a distinction there. This, this, the, 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 the rich man is more valuable. He's, 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 he's worth my time and my effort. The poor man, not so much. He can't do anything for me. Yeah? James says, no, 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 no. Not here. Out there, maybe, in the world, but in, in, in the community of people who love Jesus, who are being transformed like Jesus, we don't do that. We don't play that game. Friends, this is a very pertinent passage for us. I don't know if you've looked around the room. I love coming to church for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is which I get to look around the room and see people from all kinds of different places. At the end of the New Testament, the book of Revelation says that's what heaven's going to be like. From every tribe and every nation, people who love Jesus, who have been saved by him, are going to be there in heaven. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful picture. And so we come to church and go, but that comes with difficulties as well because we've got different colored skin. We've got different cultures. We've got different ways of thinking and viewing the world. We do things differently. We've got different concept of time even. I was talking to somebody yesterday about that. Different concept of time, different way of doing things. And so we can very quickly go, your way's not as good. You're not, th th our way's the right way. You need to be like me. I would made a distinction there. James says, no, we don't, make, we don't do favoritism in the house of God based on social status, class. We don't talk about class, but class is a big thing. Upper class, middle class, upper middle, low. I've been reading about some of this since I've been here. Upper middle and middle middle and lower middle and working class. And James says, no, when you step in to the house of God, everybody's on the same foot. Social, economic, cultural, ethnic, Sometimes we do it in a moralistic, legalistic sense. Woo, Christians don't smoke. Well, 
Now, James is going to deal with this later on. Good Christians, well, you're a second-class Christian because you still do this sin over here. We need, to tr- we need to be careful there, friends, especially when it's based on bad interpretations of this book. You do a lot of damage there. We need to be careful where our hearts are at. James says we don't do favoritism in the house of God. Full stop. End of, end of discussion. Yeah. And friends, my hope for our church is that we can learn to love each other well, like Jesus loved us. Love each other well, give each other the benefit of the doubt, ask each other questions, understand how we work, how we, how, how we see, and actually have the key thing is that Jesus is our point of unity. Yeah? We're not unified because we have hobbies in common or, or other stuff. We're unified because we've all been saved by Jesus. It's the only place on earth where people from all backgrounds, all classes, all races can come together and say, we have one thing absolutely in common. Jesus saved me. It reminds me of the story of uh, A.B. Simpson, who was the founder of the denomination I, I was ordained by in the United States. He was the pastor of the largest Presbyterian church in New York City in 18 something or the other. And he was paid the equivalent of a hundred and three figure salary dollars a year. And, and he started going down to the docks when all the immigrants were coming in. And he was preaching about Jesus to them. And they started trusting Jesus and their lives started being changed. But his nice, posh church didn't want anything to do with those folks. And so he quit the job and he started a little church down by the docks and invited all the immigrants who were starting to become Christians. He said, no, no I don't do that. I don't, we're not going to make distinctions. Jesus is for everybody. Can I be really honest for a second? As the pastor of a church, th- there's temptation in this for me as well. Someone comes to church, oh, they can do coffee and music, and oh, what do I got to do to keep them in the church? I don't want them to leave. <sighs> yeah, it's there. It's there. And like in the back of my head, I'm going, Lord, no, don't let that be my motivation. I give that one to you. I want to love people like you love people. Please don't put the pastor's family or the pastor on a pedestal either. Ah, oh, the pastor, yeah, he's supposed to be better than everybody. No, 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 that's distinctions. We don't do that. We don't play that game here. Friends, it starts in the heart. You go, I don't try to treat everybody the same, but actually at home, in the depth of your heart, you've made judgments about people. You've got a sense of moral superiority or social superiority. It starts in the depth of your heart in that private place. At home, maybe with your family. You make judgments about people. And Jesus wants to deal with that. And what he says to you is, come, return to me, repent. James tells us two reasons why why you can't do favoritism and follow Jesus at the same time. The first thing in verse 4, starting in verse 4 and then 5 through 8, is this. I I, I put on your, on your, on that little note thing I gave you, a piece of paper, I said favoritism dishonors the king. I was thinking about it again and thinking it's, we, it's because we bear his name. He gets to it at the end. But essentially what he says here is that God, he doesn't say it, but it's, 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 it's uh, understood. It's, what's the word? Suggested? Implied. God is an impartial judge. He says in verse 4, Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Ah, yeah, we're, we're not judges. Jesus is the judge. He's impartial. He's righteous. He knows people's hearts. His judgments are always good and right. Always. If we set ourselves up as judges, we get in trouble. But God is an impartial judge. You can see some of those references there. Romans and Galatians. And this is where it comes down to it is, friends, nobody comes to God through Jesus because we had a hook. Do you understand that language? Do we use that language in this country? You have a hook. When you're part of, a, of an organization and you get a promotion because you know somebody, they're your hook. Nobody had a hook with God. Everybody comes before God, and the Bible says all of the good stuff we do, it's like rubbish before God. We can't do enough good stuff to earn His love. 
Maybe you're going, well, I don't want to know a God who hates me. The good news is he doesn't hate you. You see, when you come to him because of Jesus, you were enslaved to sin. You were entangled in sin. You were apart from God. And Jesus came and he bought you back with his own blood. That's why he died on the cross. To buy you back from sin. To free you from sin so that you could know God again. So nobody comes to God with a hook. No one gets in because oh, we knew somebody. I know the big man upstairs. No, no. That's why there's no room for, impar- for, for partiality, for distinctions in the church. Because none of us, we all come on the same footing. We're all sinners. We all are broken. We sang about it earlier. We're broken. They have a brokenness in their life. Pain, sorrow, hurt. Maybe something you did, something is done to you, but we're all broken. And we all come to God on that same footing. Before Him, we, we, we've got nothing for Him to accept us. But He doesn't look at you. When you come and you say, I trust Jesus, He says, my son, my daughter, welcome. Because of Jesus, not because of you or I. And friends, if you've tried to earn your own way, you know that enormous pressure. That pressure of, we live in a culture that says, be yourself, you do you. Define yourself. The pressure of trying to, uh, who am I? What do I want to be? Who do, what am I supposed to do with my life? And Jesus says, hey, I love you. You don't have to do anything. You can't do anything, but you don't have to do anything. I did everything for you. I accept you. I don't know any other religion in the world where you can just come. Every other religion says, do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, bow down, pray eight times a day, do this, nice things, keep moral rules, and then maybe God will like you. Jesus says, just come. Come as you are, warts and all. God is impartial, and nobody, none of us has a hook. We all come on the same footing, equals. And so when we show partiality, what we're essentially doing, James says it in the next verse, he says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor, who are weak, who are rejected by the world's standards? Has not God chosen them? And you? You could hear him say. So when we start to make distinctions, what James is saying, we start to say in the church, when we gather together, all of these people have been bought by the blood of Jesus. They're precious to him. They're valuable. When we start to say, well, you're better. Sam is more valuable than Paul. And I, I, like, I like Sam. Paul, eh. Whoa. All of a sudden, I'm rejecting what God has chosen and paid for and bought with his blood. Does that make sense? You can't, you can't do Jesus and partiality, favoritism. Because Jesus said, I bought and paid for those people with my blood to set them free. And you want to you make them captive again. You want to enslave them with rules and distinctions and sects and, and, and cliques and division? No. James says no. They're chosen to be rich in faith, it says, and heirs of the kingdom. They have, just like you, they're chosen by God's grace, not based on anything they did, but based on His loving mercy. And they have a, a hope a future. That's what it means to have heirs. They have authority and they have standing in God's kingdom. They have a hope of a future with Jesus. They have hope and purpose right now, just like you do. So treat them as equals. Verse 7 is where it gets a little scary. He says, essentially, you're becoming, verse 6 and 7, he says, you're becoming like the rich, the powerful in the world who persecute you and who blaspheme the honorable, that's the king of glory, they blaspheme the name of the king. They, they, they trod on the name of the king. He says, you become like them. That should stop our hearts right there. Essentially what he's saying is, imagine if I went out into my street, I'm going to do my street party because that's where I was yesterday. But I went out to my street party and I started telling everybody about how awful my family was. And then I said, and I'm one of them. What? Who does that? You shame your family and then you claim, no. James says, why would you shame the family of God and then you're actually shaming yourself? (laughs) It's kind of silly. He says, you bear the name of the king of kings and so does everyone else who loves and trusts Jesus. They bear the name, they're a son or a daughter of the God most high. 
Treat them as such. So he says the first reason is don't, don't play favoritism because actually you're unwittingly shaming the name that you bear. You bear his name and you're dishonoring that name, the name of the king. The second reason, verses 8 through 11, he says this. He says, if you really follow the royal law, have you, have you noticed the name? This is a really good passage for this weekend because if you notice he's the Lord, the King of glory, the royal law. Yeah. The honorable name. Is, oh, they're, they're, it's the language of the king. So we are called to fill the royal law. What's the royal law? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Deuteronomy 19. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is the king. He's the righteous judge. He administers the royal law. We live under that law, the law of liberty, the law of freedom. Sounds like a good thing, right? But here's here's the thing. When, When we live under the law of liberty, but we start to make ourselves into judges, we start to create division and say, well, you're, you're in, you're not in, and don't like you, you're not like me enough, so, okay, we're going to have our little, our little party over here with the, one, the cool kids. Young people know about creating divisions, right? Yeah, Joshua? Yeah? Who's in, who's out? Yeah. Shouldn't know about that in the church. But when we set ourselves up as judges in that sense, the problem is, is that, well, you're not actually a righteous judge, you, there's some part of the law that you don't keep. This, this is where, when we, start, we set ourselves up as judges, it's where the, the you're not the boss of me reflex kicks in. Have you ever, my, your kids ever said, used to say that, my sister would say it to me, because I would set myself up as the police. You're not the boss of me. You start to set up judgments and divisions and right amongst people and say, well, this is what you have to do in order to be a, the, uh, in the in part of, of the community. And some people are going to start to go, who made you the boss? You do this and this and this wrong and you do this wrong. All of a sudden, you stick your head above the parapet of the law of liberty and the law of condemnation kicks in and goes, hang on a second. The law is perfect. You're not perfect either. So who made you the boss? God kicks in as a father, as a king. And he goes, (laughs) it's a scary place to be. You following with me? You start to, and sometimes it's unspoken. In our culture, a lot of things are unspoken. They're felt. We never say you're not in, but you could tell when you're in and when you're not. Yeah, you ever felt that? You know when you're in the good graces of whoever is the HUD honcho or the, the person who's, and you know when you're not. James says, be really careful, friends. Be really careful because you're going to get yourself into trouble with God. And we're, we've got two pictures in a minute. God is the king and God is the father that help us understand this. But when we go, just go back to that, the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Here's what it means. It means that you, yourself, as someone who has been bought by Jesus' blood, who is enjoying good relationship, you're quite happy to accept those things from Him and live in His grace. But when you start to show favoritism, you're not willing to extend that same grace to others. And so He says, love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Whoever's around you, whoever's near you, (laughs) whoever you're with, they're your neighbor. Love them in the same way that God loves you. Jesus said that to his disciples. Love one another in the same way that I loved you. How did Jesus love his disciples? He laid his life down for them. That would be an extreme case if you actually were called to die on behalf of somebody else. But oftentimes what it means to lay your life down for your neighbor is it means you let go of the things that you hold dear. Yeah? Well, I really wanted to eat pizza on a Tuesday, but Emma and David eat tacos on a Thursday. And we wanted to get together. You know, I'm going to let go of my pizza Tuesday and we'll do taco Thursday with them. I know it's taco Tuesday. You let go. 
I'm being slightly facetious, but you let go of things. And sometimes when you let go of something that's dear to you, it feels like dying. It feels like something's dying. And Jesus goes, it's okay, you can sacrifice that thing because you're loving them the way that I loved you. And friends, there's life in that. Partiality means you're happy to accept that grace from God, but you won't give it to somebody else. A couple of illustrations. Someone comes and says, Tim, we need to, we need to, this person over here, they're, they're, they're lying all the time. It's just, it's out of control, and I know they're Christian, but somebody needs to go deal with them. Okay. You know, you're busy gossiping all the time over here. Do you want me to come and deal with you as well? Well, well no, but I'm, I've gotten better. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm praying, and I, I used to be a lot worse. Well, yeah, it's because you're experiencing the grace of God. He's not coming down on you. You get to repent and work through it, and other people are coming on us. Yeah, but you need to go deal with that guy. <laughs> Do you see it? Yes? No? That's why... Sometimes there is genuine sin in someone's life. And Jesus does, sin is not just, it's not a moral thing where it's like, no, sin is actually killing us. So sometimes there is sin in, in, in I have sin in my life, you have sin in your life. Jesus wants to deal with it. Sometimes he uses other people, but we need to be humble, filled with the Spirit, extending grace. If you're operating under the law, Somebody needs to go deal with them. You should not go talk to that person. <laughs> it's not your place. Yeah? The answer to sin is never law. It's always grace. It's always Jesus. He's the one who deals with sin. He dealt with it on the cross, and he continues to deal with it in your life. And friends, this isn't a, well, you need to be a perfect person. No, it's sin, sin is what's keeping you from life fullness of life, joy, peace, hope. Don't you want those things? Jesus wants to deal with them. But we need to tread lightly and we need to not operate in a law way towards one another. Two stories as we close. It's Matthew 18, if you turn with me. Two pictures because what James is saying is that the vertical, your vertical relationship with the Lord Jesus and your horizontal relationship with other people who also love the Lord Jesus, who are chosen by him, who belong to him, they're connected. And so here's how he puts it in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21. Peter, the apostle Peter, comes up to Jesus and he says, Lord, how many times are we supposed to forgive people? I'm going to paraphrase this, so if it's, so I'm going to go a little faster. How many times do we have to forgive somebody? Is it seven times? And Jesus says, not seven times, but 77 times. It was a symbolic way of saying, as many as it takes. And so he tells a parable. He says, he says there was a king and he wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And so there was one servant who came to him and he couldn't pay his debt back to the king. And he said, please, please, I'll pay it back, I promise. Just give me a little more time. And the king was gracious and kind to him. And he said, I'll give you more time. And so the servant went away. And on his way out of the king's palace, he came across a fellow servant who owed him money. And he started beating the guy. He said, pay me what you owe right now. And he had him thrown in prison. And the other servants heard about it. And they went back to the king and they said, that ain't right. You forgave him and then he had his fellow, prison, fellow servant thrown in prison. It's not right. And so the king brought him back in. And here's what he says. In verse 32, the master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, the master delivered him to the jailers. He fell under the king's judgment because he wasn't willing to extend the same mercy he had received. Jesus says this in Matthew in chapter 6. He says, 
if you don't forgive others, neither will God forgive you. The reason is because when you refuse, the way you treat other people who belong to Jesus, you're essentially saying to God, this, see, this is how I want you to treat me. It's kind of scary. It's kind of scary. It should have us walk carefully. If you've got unforgiveness in your life, in your heart, if you've got mercy that you haven't extended, if you've got something between you and a, a, a fellow brother or sister, family member, and Jesus is saying, hey, if you want me to forgive you, you need to do the same to others. If you want to experience my grace, if you want to experience my mercy, you need to do the same. Have you ever had that conversation with your kids? If you've got multiple kids? It's a conversation worth having. I've said it to my kids. Hey, son, you're over, here be, you're over here treating your sister like dirt. I love you, but we're not okay right now. I still love you, but you and I are not okay because you and your sister are not okay because I love you both. Yeah? And that's the picture. That's the second picture. A father and his children. That's Matthew chapter 6. God says, as a father, if you don't forgive, your, your, if you don't forgive others, I'm not going to forgive you either. Because what you're saying to God is, God, this is how I think you operate. Please operate towards this for me. I can still remember as a kid, and I don't remember what it was, but I was driving. I can remember exactly where we were, driving down the hill on the way to school. And I said to my dad, you know what? When I'm a parent, I'm, gonna do, I'm not going to let my kids do this. And he said, oh, do you think I should do that with you? I was like, well, no. Well, why would you do it with your kids? Where does, where does James end? He gets to verse 12 and 13. It's, it's a really simple principle, right? How have you experienced Jesus, the grace, the mercy? Extend that to others. And so James gets to verses 12 and 13. And he says, so, therefore, summing up. So, speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. This is how it works in my house. I'm not actively going around trying to find fault with my kids. But as soon as one of them starts picking on another one, I'm going, hang on a second, you over here, you're out of line. The law of condemnation kicks in. But the law of liberty is, hey, love, love one another. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you go to God and say, oh, how, how do I love my sister Emma? How do I love a brother best? How, how do I do that? You're focused on what God wants from you, not on well, how do I keep the rules? But as soon as you're out of line and you refuse to extend the same grace, the law kicks in and God goes, whoa, 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 whoa. So friends, if you want to live under the law of liberty in good relationship with the Lord Jesus, with your heavenly Father, with others, he says, speak and act as if you have been judged under the law of liberty. You're free. Jesus bought you with his blood. You're free. The judgment is without mercy, to one who has shown no mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I think a lot of that starts, that, that humility starts with remembering and recognizing how much you have been forgiven. You remember that verse in Luke chapter 7? Jesus is saying to the woman who is of, of um, who anointed his feet and she's being judged because she's supposedly a woman of, of bad character and Jesus says, hey, she's been forgiven much and so she loves much. What he's, what he's saying is not that some of us have been forgiven less. We've all been forgiven a lot. Sometimes we forget. You need to remember how much Jesus has forgiven you. I can still remember times in my youth, still young, when I was younger. I can still remember times when I, I came up and there was this moment, I, I think as I followed Jesus and I was freed from sin, there was this moment where I came up against the, the temptation to do something. And, I, and I, I, there was this moment where I had a choice. You been there? You're going, oh, it's painful. I could do this. I know, it's, I, know, I know it's not good for me. I know I'm not honoring Jesus when I do it. 
and you have that moment. And I remember, I eventually turned, I walked away from, but I remember looking over the edge and seeing what I could become. You been there? Or maybe it's you look back and you go, yeah, I remember what I used to be like. I remember who I used to be. Maybe it's a combination of those two things. You go, given the right circumstances, the right people, the right decisions on my part, I could, I'm capable of all kinds of awful stuff. And, you, and yet Jesus accepted you as you were. All the junk. All the pain. All the brokenness. And he said, my son, my daughter, Come. You don't have to get perfect before you come. Just come. We need to remember, recognize what we were saved from, out of. Because we have a Savior who loves you, who gave his life for you. He shed his blood on your behalf. And so, friends, we as a community, we get to do that for each other. It's a privilege. Do you feel that? What does it look like to love? What does it look like to love one another in that way? My challenge to you is this, as we, as we walk away, is, is, is friends, if you, have loved, if you love and trust in Jesus, if you're going, oh, I follow Jesus, he's my king, he's my savior, you have his Holy Spirit inside of you. And so as, you, as we're walking around after service this next week, as you, as we're building, most of us haven't known each other for more than, a year or two, maybe. But as we're building a relationship, and you ask the Lord, hey, who do you want me to serve in this community? Who do you want me to serve? Who do I need to go out of my way? Maybe it's just a, I've never talked to that person before. Let me go out of my way. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's a, I give this person a lift. Maybe it's, I, I don't know what it is. But you have the Holy Spirit inside you. The real ministry of this church is not for me. It's not for the church leadership. It's not for Anita and and Janina and people who are up front serving. It's, It's for all of us. Each one of you, if you trust Jesus, you have his Holy Spirit inside. You have the power, the the discernment to go, he can go, "Ah, that, that person right there. Just go talk to him. Yeah. That's my challenge. Can we walk forward in that together? and love one another as Christ loved us.